Hello and welcome to Property Question Time. My name is Stephen Galpin and this is the programme where you can have your property related questions answered by our team of property experts. Joining me today is Joanna Leggett, co-founder of Leggett Immobilier, French property experts. Welcome Joanna. Thank you Stephen, nice to see you. Did you travel safely? Yes, it's a lot easier now. So I came over on the train, follow the Eurostar. Yeah. So you've had all sorts of jabs and it's all yes, right now. Yes, I have my passports now. Right, great stuff. <laughs> Right, and on your right is John Howard, property developer, author, TV commentator and public speaker. Hello, John. Hello. No need for anything like that for me, from Ipswich. Straight in. Did I say a word about Ipswich? No, but Ipswich? you were about to, so I got in quick. <laughs> no, I'm sure Ipswich is lovely. and It's actually, all vaccinated. And as we discussed earlier, I really will come and have a look. I'm looking forward to taking you for lunch. Great stuff. Oh, that's... Uh... That's intriguing. Right. OK. All right. So um, for question one, Joanna, I'm planning a trip to France to view as many properties as I can this autumn before deciding which to purchase. Have any restrictions on viewing been put in place due to COVID? Uh, have they been removed? Does it now leave travel and property access unrestricted? Um, well, firstly, we do still take care in viewings. We do ask the agents to wear masks and hand gel where possible to use separate cars just in case. Um, we ask the vendor to not be present at the viewing and have the doors all open, etc. Um, but there is no restrictions. You know, we are fully selling. Um, it's been a really, really busy summer of selling in France as well. Um, there's no quarantine, providing that you have been double vaccinated. If you haven't been double vaccinated, you need to have a PCR test to be able to do a viewing. Um, but in France at the moment, you have to have um, your passport, your sort of vaccination passport, so even to be able to go to a restaurant or a bar. Um, so, you know, it's, it's quite important if you are looking at coming over to view lots of properties that you make sure you do have your vaccination certificates um, and or, or, or a PCR test that you will have to keep doing every three days. OK. Well, what's your personal view on these passports? Do you, are, are you pleased to see them in action in France? Do you think we should do it here? Well, for me, I mean, obviously it's a pain, isn't it? It's a pain for everybody, and you know. But at the end of the day, they're there to protect, um, you know, the health service and everything else. And for from my point of view, I travel a lot, um, so it's it's always going to be necessary for me. If you don't really travel so much, then it's not that important. Um, I'm not sure whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but we get scanned everywhere that we go. So if we go into a bar, they'll scan the passport with the barcode to make sure that it is actually fully registered. Amazing. And is their track and trace system, uh, shall we dare say it, a bit better than ours? I don't think we, they, they, don't, they don't kind of do track and trace. They scan your sort of COVID passport um, and that's it really. We don't, it's not really a track and trace type service. They're just checking to make sure that you've been fully vaccinated before you go in anywhere. Mm, sounds mm. quite good. John, you're, you're a developer. I know you've got one particular development that's still under sales, um, sort of. Uh, Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's all right. Got a few, but I think one you, especially. I think, I, think, I, think, <laughs> I think you're doing very well. Thank you. Um, do, you do you have any sort of COVID restrictions for people? Well, it's, it's very interesting because we've obviously got uh, Funny Country Norfolk we own as well. And um, there, certainly to start with, we did the same thing. You know, the vendor, the, the owner of the property, had to go out, mm. sit in their car or whatever right. while, the, while the viewing yeah. was being taken, especially in the winter, it wasn't, yeah. too, wasn't too hard for them to do that. And of course, actually not having the owner in the house babbling away, yeah, is helps. Probably, it helps, yeah. helps get the sale done, to be honest <laughs> with you. So, that, so all the guys and girls seem to really uh, think that was a good idea. And we are careful, we, we mask and we do you know, hand gel and so on still. Um, as a matter of respect, actually, more than anything mm. else for, for, for the vendors and, all, and also the purchasers. Mm. Um, so that works well. With our developments, um, same thing. You know, the, the, the salespeople who, who, who sell them for us, um, you know, would wear a mask, uh, would ask, to be honest with you these days, probably ask rather than wear the mask, would you, would you like me to wear a mask or whatever? And in fact, um, Cheryl, who's a, as our top, top, top lady, she had COVID a couple of weeks ago, you know, so, and she double jabbed and everything. Mm. Yeah. Yes, well, it, it's a difficult subject, it isn't is. it? I mean, it's it's how much a government or any other authority wants to intervene into your life. And mm. I mean, you do have the worry where a government like we have here, for instance, mm. has, has been so interventionist over the last 18 mm. months. You wonder if they're actually going to want to give away the powers that they've got. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we'll see, won't we? We will see. And, and, and of course, they know 
with this track and trace business, they know what everyone's doing all the time. Exactly, That's if yeah. they didn't already, yeah. by the way, but mm. <laughs> they do now. So there you are, Joanna. They're probably even tracking you in France at this <laughs> yeah. moment. Tracking or you or they want to know why you're here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, okay, great stuff. Um, John, your question. Mm -hmm. Right, quite a long one. Right. I'm trying to sell my property in a fairly large residential development of apartments. There are mm. some works that the developer has to do to bring the building up to the new fire safety standards. Right. A government grant has been agreed. The problem is that the purchaser's solicitors are requesting sight of the new EWS1 mm. certificate prior to exchange of contracts. <laughs> The managing mm. agents for my building tell me that the certificate will not be issued until all the remedial works on the building have been totally completed, which could take up to a year. Does this mean effectively I won't be able to sell my flat for the next 12 months? Are there any ways around this problem? OK, well, first of all, uh, um, the person sounds like an owner occupier, but actually it's, it applies to any investment property that someone might have as well. Very, very, very uh, good question. Um, and obviously they're concerned, rightly so. So the first thing I would say is that um, there's no way you'll get an e uh, EWS certificate one um, on the building till all the work's completed. That's the first thing. So, uh, and, and I can understand the solicitor for the, for the purchaser being concerned because uh, they're covering and looking after their client's interests and they're doing the right thing, absolutely right. However, if everything is in place, the grant's in place, and they get a legal undertaking uh, from, the, from the freehold company that the works are, 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 are starting and continuing and will be completed within a certain time, a certain a period of time, then I, I, would, I would personally take the view that that's fine um, and that as long as all the, all the cost is covered by the current vendor, the current owner, or, not, or the grant in this case, or the case. grant in this case, probably a combination of both should be truthful, mm -hmm. then I don't see any problem with that as long as there is a un legal undertaking to do so. You don't see any problem. No. Do you think a funder would? Well, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's interesting. I, I think that in the circumstances, because um, there's a government grant on this building, I would have thought most lenders have, are going to have to, if they're not already, are going to have to take a more sensible approach mm. to what they did originally, because things have moved on mm. uh, and there's more confidence about what's happening now and so on. Um, I mean, the, 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 the best way of doing it actually is to say, well, look, if the works are 26,000 per flat, then that 20, then we will retain 26,000 pounds from the, from the seller and put it, you know, with the solicitor until all the works are done and then that money can be transferred to, to the seller of the property. That would be another way of doing it. But I, I would be relatively confident that if everything was in place and the works were commencing, say, in, in six weeks' time or something like that, uh, I wouldn't be too concerned. OK. I'm just wondering, I wonder if there's anything one could put in place, like the insurance that you take out for searches, for instance. Um, I wonder if you could take out an insurance for the undertaking. I, I, I would have thought the insurance is that you have a whatever the, the amount is per flat is kept on deposit by, you know, by, by the vendor solicitor and, to, and not released until the works are finished. That would be the best insurance policy you could have. Mm, I suppose so. Um, Joanna, has, has any of this um, safety business spread over into France? Do, have they, do they know about our Grenfell disaster and what, what went on with this unsafe cladding? Is there any repetition well, of this in France? Uh, not, not that I know of, but um, obviously they're aware because it's on the news, etc. But as far as I'm, I'm aware, I don't think so. I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah. Isn't it? Because a lot of these systems are European systems, you know, mm. that were used for, for the overcladding mm -hmm. of buildings. Um, I mean, it's quite interesting, John, because I know I was talking to one of the leading agents here in Canary Wharf last week, and they were saying that practically all these apartments in Canary Wharf, of which there must be, I don't know, 20, 30,000, perhaps mm, more, more all unsaleable for this last year because no EWS1 certificates. Yeah. I, don't, I just don't know how we, we get around it, really. Well, I've explained how you get around it. So ho hopefully people will take some advice on that because I genuinely think that is the way around it, honestly. Mm. Yeah. There's probably not a lot of alternatives, no, is there? No, I don't think there is. Okay. Um, I mean, just just um, out of London, John, again, you've got developments all over, over mm -hmm. the place. Are you seeing the same kind of um, 
worry about this safety issue sort of nationwide. And I say that because, um, as I think we mentioned in one of our previous programmes, um, there's been a recent survey. They say there's over a thousand buildings in London alone that are not technically safe at this point in time, which is quite worrying. It is a lot. It is a lot. But um, it depends what's actually wrong with them, because a lot of them, the cladding is fine. It's, it's non-combustible and it's more of just the fire breaks that in, at each level that now need to be put in that didn't need to be put in before, you know, years ago. I, what I would say, the big cities have got issues, the big cities. So, you know, Manchester, Liverpool, Birmingham, that type of, uh, th those sort of cities of where they've got high rise, which have been built in the last 10, 20 years, an awful lot have been built. Mm. Um, yeah, a lot of investors own these as well. A lot of people, you know, watching this show will own um, investment properties in these high rise blocks. Uh, high rise is considered over six stories, mm. over six stories. Uh, and, and from the point of view of the combustible cladding, that's over 18 metres high, mm. over 18. So anything less than 18 metres. You don't need to do EWS certificates or anything. Okay. No. And just finally, John, who, who's the arbitrator over EWS1 certificates? If you feel that one is being withheld perhaps unfairly or, or I, I mean, there are, there are a myriad of problems that have been cited in this safety business. Yep. I mean, essentially, the, the, the main focus was on cladding. Mm. Since then, we found other things yeah, that, that absolutely. are wrong. Well, it's yeah, always the same, isn't it? Yeah. You know, they, you, you look, you look for one thing yeah. and you find another. Yeah. Um, who's what, the arbitrator? Well, I would say the local authority, because they're the ones who issue the, the, the fire certificate, or the, well, do they? Well, the fire officer does, but indirectly with the, with the council, and also, also the completion certificate on any works and build a regulation approval. So really, um, the local authorities have been thrown a, a real hospital so, so pass, if you, really. If, you, if you've been refused a certificate, in yes. your view, unjustly, yeah. you'd go to the council. I yeah. would. I'd start with them and work backwards. Yeah, definitely. OK. Well, I'm not going to ask you if you've got anything to add to that, Joanna, because it seems to be a UK-wide problem. I only. think as well, if you look at Paris, for example, we don't really have high-rise buildings. That's interesting, you see. It's, yeah, it's very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Good, good on you. <laughs> right answer. <laughs> yeah. Right answer. <laughs> yeah, right answer. OK, well, that's all we've got time for in this half of the show, so join me again after the break. Welcome back to part two of Property Question Time. Joining me are Joanna Leggett and John Howard. Welcome back. Thank you. Joanna, since Brexit and the delay in feeling the effects of it have been exaggerated because of COVID, do the experts think that the type of person emigrating to France has changed greatly? I'm wondering if people are rather more hesitant to retire there, for example, now that there are far more procedural difficulties in place for residency, etc. Well, firstly, most of the clients that we deal with, the average age of a client is actually 53, so it's early before retirement age. Uh, probably only about 20% of our business is to retirees. Um, it will have changed, yes, but the type of person that comes to France isn't going to change. They're always going to be, you know, the love of the lifestyle, etc. Um, and bearing in mind that most of the British that do come to France are coming for lifestyle, not for investment, unless they're looking at proper areas, perhaps like the Alps, for example. Um, so I don't think it. I don't think it has really changed. You obviously have to now, if you want to live there permanently, you've got to prove your income, which is around fifteen thousand a year. Um, you'd have to go through that process, which we didn't have to do before. And if you're buying a holiday home, obviously you can only now stay for ninety days maximum, so three months, whereas before you could stay for six months. So that might alter it yeah. a little bit. So can mm. I just clarify? Oh, there's a couple of points. So is that three months in any one year or is it three months and then a break? You have to have three months and then three months out and then three months you can come back in again. So that is a real pain and we're hoping that at some stage that might change. However, if you think of somebody who's bought a holiday home, generally speaking, they'll be working and who has three months holiday? You know, you might get five weeks a year and the rest of the time it can be rented out. Um, however, we do have, as you say, retirees that do six months in the UK and six months in France. So it has affected them with, um, with coming out of Brexit. Mm. Um, that's just a bit petty, isn't it, from the French or the European authorities, really, to stop to start. Don't well, I'm down just not? interested, really. It, 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 it's quite difficult to balance, isn't it? Mm. I'm, I'm presuming that if you're English and you bought a French property, chances are when you come to sell it, 
you'll be looking to the UK market because you'll know the agent, you'll know, you, mm -hmm. you'll have bought through the agent who's probably mm. a UK French agent, mm. just as yourselves mm -hmm. perhaps. Um, but actually, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage, aren't you? Because you, you're trying to sell to somebody who can only go there for three months at a time. Whereas if you're actually aiming at a market, say, the to European Belgian market. people mm -hmm. or, or whoever, you can stay as long as they like. Exactly. But then saying that, I mean, Brits are still the highest of all international buyers in France. They represent 22% of the market, followed by the Belgians, which is 19%. So Brits still are the biggest of why, all international why properties. Why the Belgians? Belgians are the second yeah. highest nationality, followed by Germans and Dutch. Why the Belgians? Though? They're easy, easy to get to. Yeah. They love yeah. of France. You know, they can drive across, yeah. weekend, mm. holiday homes, that type of thing. There's an awful lot of Belgians, yeah. particularly in the rural areas and countryside areas. Right. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. interesting. Yeah. And what about in the south, where everybody loves to have a holiday? Well, the, the Cote d'Azur, for example, and the Alps is much more of an international clientele, whereas, for example, in the Nouvelle Aquitaine, where I am, which is the Dordogne, it's mainly Brits, Belgians, Dutch and English, obviously French, um, but they're, <laughs> they're everywhere. Just a few. Just a few. Yeah. Just yeah. A few. <laughs> yeah. Probably not that many. Um, but in, in the Cote d'Azur, it's much more international, so you'll get your, your Swedish, your Swiss, you know, all nationalities buying there, and it's still the most popular area for, um, for sales. I mean, this is a very broad question, but I mean, do you, do you think that since Brexit, many of the changes have been sort of covered over because of COVID and because of the concern with COVID? So we're, we're still not actually feeling the effects of Brexit yet. No, I don't. I, it's sort of come and gone, hasn't it? <laughs> well, it's, you know, it, it doesn't, well, it's you know, either come yeah. and been ignored or yeah. gone. I'm not sure yeah. which. I mean, I think with the Brits that were already living there or were buying up until the end of last year, all got in before December the 31st because then they weren't affected and they could apply for their carts as you're straight away, which right, is your work gotcha, permit. I see, yeah, right. So that was the mm. kind of cut off deadline. Anybody that comes now after that date has to go through a, a lot longer process to be able to get a cart de jour. But it's still possible. And if you're working or you're working from home or whatever it's a just quite a straightforward process yes um just to go back slightly on one of, one of the points we talked of earlier you were, you were saying that now you have to prove income and that's mm -hmm. likely to be an, an expected around about fifteen thousand mm. a year um what happens to a retired person they've obviously got capital mm -hmm. um how does the capital equate with the with the earning requirements you're not going to be earning so what capital well you usually you'd have a pension coming in so that would be classed towards that 15,000 and yeah if you can prove that you've got that amount of money in the bank but what, what sort would... of capital would you need to get your residency do you think well you have to prove that you would have at least 15,000 for a year so you'd have to prove however many years you're going to be there that you have 15,000 each year. So if you had a lump sum of 100,000, then however long that would last for. Because the carte de are only valid for 10 years. Okay. Then you have to reapply. Right. Mm. I'm just thinking that might be a bit traumatic for somebody so in, you know, in, in, in much later years, mm. suddenly ending up at sort of 85 or something and then having to prove yeah. what they've got coming yeah. in. in the... That's just unfortunate with Brexit is, you know, that we're not, in Europe anymore so well we're in Europe but not in the European Union so yeah that is that could could be possibly be a problem yeah mm. I just think it would be quite disruptive to yeah. your, to your they probably have equity account. in the house though in, yeah, in, in the property so, if you, been there so, a long so time. if you purchase the property you can count that towards your well if you own the property then obviously you could do equity release if necessary to to do that or you could sell it and buy something smaller which is a lot what a lot of people do do because when you first move to France everybody has all the land and all the great big properties and there's so much of it however when you start getting a bit older you think do I really want to be upkeeping I know the feeling I know the feeling I know the feeling and we do we do tend to see like the five the ten and then the fifteen years yeah, of yeah. buying a new property and selling their big old you know great stately home type yeah. place um, because it's the upkeep you know to keep these good big places tell going I, I, tell I, me about it I can, I can remember having a place in Derbyshire and every weekend traveling up from London and then spending the entire weekend mowing the, well oh, that's what the happens and, yeah yeah and, uh, four hours on a ride on mower <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay Joanna thank you for that um, now this is a question for you John but actually it'll um, be interesting to spark some debate between you both but do the panel think that the trend towards totally online agency <laughs> is actually reversing and going mm. back towards the more conventional high street agents with shop fronts and window displays John well 
we can both answer this one, can't we, Joe? I mean, for me, it's very interesting because everyone a few years ago was really concerned about online estate agencies. And um, interestingly, during this lockdown, if anything, uh, the online uh, auctions have gone through the roof mm -hmm. because there's only way you can you can do it. But actually, the estate agencies, more traditional estate agencies, have done very, very, very well. Mm -hmm. So it's almost been a reverse to, to how it was because um, before lockdown, online auctions were a disaster. Property auctions were a total disaster. We tried at Auction House UK, where I was a you know, major shareholder for many years, and uh, we couldn't get it right at all. Uh, but suddenly, of course, ev now everyone's having to do it. They've got it all right. And, and every auction at the moment just about is online. Whereas with the estate agency, everyone was worried about these, these competitors. There's one especially that advertises a lot on TV. Um, and, and actually, you know, that's been the reverse. The, the traditional agent has done much better. Um, and the onlines will probably say they've done very well, but I'm not, I'm not sure they have. Well, I know with the with, with the online agents. Mm. I mean, the most sort of prolific one, if you mm. if you like, they've actually, I think, either closed down or reduced their their efforts in the states and in, in, in other. They got in, very in ambitious in Australia, America, yeah. and I think basically their shareholders told them to get it right in England first, which is pretty off, yeah. pretty straight, yeah. pretty sensible yeah. <laughs> advice. Yeah, I mean, I know, Joanna, you're you're particular agency set up, you offer a very personal service, a very complete service in mm -hmm. what you do. Um, do you have a lot of competition from purely online agents? Not really, because we're sort of in a bit of a niche in the market because we deal with French, obviously, but we also deal with international clients. Mm -hmm. So we have to be online for that. But we also advertise on portals so that yeah. we're everywhere. Yeah. Um, but we also have high street shops. Um, so we have we have both. But because France is so big and, you know, when particularly for international buyers, you might be covering maybe an hour or two hours distance mm -hmm. between properties. So there's no real need to have a high street shop. Generally, the agent will meet them in the in the village or the town yeah. of where the yeah. property Property is otherwise it's traveling so much it's, traveling for the agent and it, client it's very interesting our, mm. our estate agents which are in market towns small market towns are still got people coming mm. in them and actually the market the market in the market towns the shops during during the lockdown have done very well mm. um, whereas the, the uh, offices we have in big cities is exactly the opposite to what you're mm. saying you know it's, it's what you're saying in as much that no one's no one's walking in them at all but if we get rid of those offices, all our competition, all our competitors say, oh, they haven't even got an office mm. in the town centre or city centre. So it's a difficult mm. one. And you've got to work from somewhere. Mm. So actually, you might as well have a high street presence with a big sign up, even if no one comes in. Because we're kind of the opposite. We have our branches in the big cities. We don't yeah. have them in the countryside no, because there's no need. No point. There's no yeah, thing, and yeah. you wouldn't yeah. see them. And no. there's not enough footfall. Yeah. 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 yeah, but we do have them in Paris, yeah. Bordeaux, for yeah. example, and places, and yeah. Nice. Yeah. You know, in the bigger cities. They all sound nice mm. places, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps we'll get an invitation sometime. We keep being nice to Joe. We might get an invitation to have a look around. I've been waiting a long time. Oh, yeah, yeah, we have been waiting a while since actually already. Yeah, you're right. But I mean, coming back to the actual question, do we do we think online is in decline? I don't. Th well, I, I, whether it's in decline or not, it hasn't got the traction that they thought they were going to get. It's how I would see it. Mm. Uh, and yeah, yes, we're all online into as much we're on the all on mm. the property portals, and, and there's no point advertising in the newspapers. We stopped doing that probably ten years ago now. A waste of time. Mm. It's all online. I mean, ninety five percent of property searches start online. Or yeah, something, don't they? that's right. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 amazing. I mean, but so you still need that personal service. Mm. Some of the portals are really excellent, aren't oh, they? Oh, fantastic. Mm, mm. They tell you everything you want to know. Yeah, I mean, you can go around an area, you can pick prices up, you can pick but the But remember, remember, getting a buyer is only 30% 30, 30 of the job. Getting that buyer through mm. everything to completion is the 70%. And that's where an estate agent really works mm. well, really works hard, personal service, getting to know, you know both parties and getting the deal done. I think you're absolutely right, John. And I mean, I, I, I also think there's a sort of second factor is that property is such a personal thing. It's such an mm. emotive thing. Mm. Massive thing. I, I, Massive. I'm not sure people want to just press a button and, and, and buy. Mm. No. Um, I think they want that bit of attention, mm. that bit of mm. service. I mean, it's, it's a little bit like the sort of in property development, you will know, John, you, you, you can perhaps spend 30 or 40 pounds on a really nice brochure for, for, for a property. 
Now that brochure actually won't sell the property. What it does, it gives the buyer confidence. When they go mm. home and sit down, what have I done? Mm. They look at the brochure, they flick through it, and think, um, you know what? And yeah, more, I'm, I'm and doing more importantly, thing. they pass it to their friends. Yes, exactly. On the so, show, yes. oh, this, feels, this feels nice. This oh, is yeah. what I'm buying, yeah. I, I think for us, because obviously it's a foreign country with a foreign language, mm. so most clients will generally want to use an agent. Absolutely. Because it's, you know, buying blind and in a foreign country yeah. where you don't know the rules and regulations, you do need physically to be able without, to speak to someone and ask, ask the questions. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, your, your job is particularly difficult because you, you've really got to do a sort of hand-holding exercise yeah. to a degree. It, well, it totally it? is because know, you're translating as well. I know when well. I used to yeah. do your kind of work, I, <laughs> I, I can remember I used to have somebody to say to me, you know, it's time for an argument. You know, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you've got to sort of cut the ties with, yeah. the, with the mover because you, you'll end up, you know, it'll be, can you, can you, come with me to the post office and show me how to do that, this. That can does you, happen, you, you, yeah. I mean, yeah. I used to have people coming around, can you translate the gas say, bill and can you I'd, do this? I'd, lo you I'd do love that? you, Tom Han, going down to the <laughs> yeah, post office yeah, and yeah. things. I don't, know how, I don't yeah. know how you could afford to do it for too long, but... Uh... Yeah, but it is, it, I think it is a completely different yeah. role in France for the estate agent. I mean, I've got children into schools. I've taken them to meet the school children. It's amazing. You know, I've taken them to the doctors to find out if they yeah. can get their medication. I mean, you just wouldn't need to do that no, in the UK no, but, because but people do it themselves. That's an amazing service. Yeah. Amazing service. Yeah. I hope you get really great fees. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I really do. I really do. Okay, well, that's all we've got time for on this show. So. Thank you very much to John Howard and Pleasure. Joanna Leggett. Thank, Thank you both for coming in and sharing your knowledge with us. Look forward to seeing you next time on Property Question Time.